I get word on page 233 of Christianity and the Social Crisis by Walter Rauschenbusch. Now he is discussing in the wake of his discussion of the Industrial Revolution, the morale of the workers after a century of that revolution, the age of the machines. He says, the existence of a large class of population without property rights in the material they work upon and the tools they work with, and without claim to the profits resulting from their work, must have subtle and far-reaching effects on the character of this class and on the moral tone of the people at large. A man's work is not only the price he pays for the right to fill his stomach. It, in his work, he expresses himself. It is the output of his creative energy and his main contribution to the common life of mankind. The pride which an artist or professional man takes in his work, the pleasure which a housewife takes in adorning her home, afford a satisfaction that ranks next to human love in delightsomeness. One of the gravest accusations against our industrial system is that it does not produce in the common man the pride and joy of good work. In many cases, the surroundings are ugly, depressing, and coarsening. Much of the stuff manufactured is dishonest in quality, made to sell and not to serve. And the making of such cotton or wooden lies must react on the morals of every man that handles them. There is little opportunity for a man to put his personal stamp on his work. The medieval craftsman could rise to be an artist by working well at his craft. The modern factory hand is not likely to develop artistic gifts as he tends his machine. It is a common and true complaint of employers that their men take no interest in their work. But why should they? What motive have they for putting love and care into their work? It is not theirs. Christ spoke of the difference between the hireling shepherd who flees the owner who loves his sheep. Well, our system has made the immense majority of industrial workers mere hirelings. If they do conscientious work, nevertheless, it is a splendid tribute to human rectitude. Slavery was cheap labor. It was also dear labor. In ancient Rome, the slaves on the country estates were so wasteful that only the strongest and crudest tools could be given them. The more the wage worker approaches their condition, the more will the employer confront the same problem. The finest work is done only by free minds who put love into their work because it is their own. When a workman becomes a partner, he hustles in a new spirit. Even the small bonus distributed in profit-sharing experiments have been found to increase the carefulness and willingness of the men to such an extent that the bonus did not diminish the profits of the employers. The lowest motives for work are the desire for wages and the fear of losing them. Yet these are almost the only motives to which our system appeals. It does not even hold out the hope of promotion unless a man unites managing ability to his workmanship. The economic loss to the community by this paralysis of the finer springs of human action is beyond computation. But the moral loss is vastly more threatening. The fear of losing his job is the workman's chief incentive to work. Our entire industrial life for employer and employee is a reign of fear. The average workman, working man's family is only a few weeks removed from destitution. The dread of want is, almost, is always over them, and that is worse than brief times of actual want. It is often said in defense of the wages system that while the workman does not share in the hope of profit, neither is he troubled by the danger of loss. He gets his wage even if the shop is running at a loss. Not for any length of time. His form of risk is the danger of being out of work when work grows slack and when his job is gone, all his resources are gone. In times of depression, the misery and anxiety among the working people are appalling. Yet periodical crises hitherto have been able have been an unavoidable accompaniment of our speculative industry. The introduction of new machinery, the reorganization of an industry by a trust, the speeding of machinery which makes fewer men necessary, the competition of cheap immigrant labor, all combine to make the hold of the working classes on the means of life insecure. That working men ever dare to strike work is remarkable testimony to the economic pressure that impels them into the capacity of sacrifice for common ends among them. 
While a workman is in his prime, he's always in danger of losing his job. When he gets older, he is almost certain to lose it. Pace is so rapid that only supple limbs can keep up. Once out of a job, it is hard for an elderly man to get another. Men shave clean to conceal gray hairs. They are no longer a crown of honor, but an industrial handicap. A man may have put years of his life into a business, but he has no claim on it at the end, except the feeble claim of sympathetic pity. President Eliot thinks that he has a just but unrecognized claim because he has helped to build the goodwill of the business. There is a stronger claim in the fact that the result of his work has never been paid to him in full. If, for instance, a man has proved a net value of six, of eight hundred dollars a year and has received five hundred a year, three hundred annually stand to his credit in the sight of God. These dividends with compound interest would amount to a tidy sum at the end of a term of years and ought to suffice to employ him at his old wages even if his productive capacity declines. But at present, unless his employer is able and willing to show him charity, or unless by unusual thrift he has managed to save something, he becomes dependent on the faithfulness of his children or the charity of the public. In England, a very large proportion of the aged working people finally go on the parish, that is, get church support. In Germany, they have a socialist system of insurance for old age. Don't forget, this is 1907. The fact that so few Germans have emigrated in recent years is probably due, in part, to the hope held out by this slight capitalization of their life's labor. We are not even thinking of such an institution in America. Fear and insecurity weigh upon our people increasingly and break down their nerves, their mental buoyancy, and their, their character. And of course, uh, income tax was still to come. I'll put a link in to Martin Hengel's work on property and wealth in the early church.